Hello everyone thank for watch special news brought for you from Terrace News TV. President Muhammadu Buhari and Vice President Yemi Osin Bajo will take part in a two-hour live town hall meeting called The Candidates. The event will be shown live on the network service of the NTA and partner stations and online via area media on Wednesday, January 16, 2019 at 7 p.m. It will be moderated by Kaderia Ramt. The candidates will answer questions from the moderator, from the audience, and from viewers at home. Welcome back. You are watching The Candidates, a presidential town hall series brought to you by Daria Media and the Nigerian Television Authority with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. We are in conversation with the presidential and vice presidential candidates of the ruling APC, the incumbent president and of course the vice president, retired general Muhammadu Buhari and Professor Yemi Oshibanjo. A quick reminder for those watching at home, you can still take part by sending your questions using the social media handles scrolling across the screen. We will do our best to ask as many questions as possible. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, before the break, we took a few questions from members of the audience. There was a question about what your plans are for the Almajiris in the north. There was a question about uh, the livestock plan. And finally, there was a question about the disability bill. Um, because there are about 25 million people thought to live with some form of disability in Nigeria. And people are interested in knowing what this government um, is going to do about uh, improving their situation. Yes, sir. So maybe we start with the Almajiri with Mr. President. Yes, what the Almajiri case, um, I think um, uh, we have to look at the series of government responsibilities. The federal, the state, and the local governments. And the allocation of resources, revenue allocation formula, and so on. Relative to the resources available to the country, monies are dispensed to the three-tier government system. So the question of al case this lack of virtually primary, the basic education, are all lo local government problems. <laughs> so even if, even if the center has extra money, they wouldn't take it and build classrooms, equip them, employ qualified teachers from the federal uh, revenue, while it is the duty of the local, local governments. If the local governments are not being given the money by the governors or by the state, then it's up to the, the, the local governments to come together and scream loud enough for Nigerians to hear them so that, um, so that the, 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 there will be proper allocation of resources uh, by the constitutional means. Mr. President, that part is, of... That's for the Almajiris. Yes, sir. Let me just ask a little follow-up questions regarding that. P part of the, the frustrations that some people have with the way Nigeria is structured is that we seem to have sometimes confusion. So technically, we'd sort of say something like primary education resides with local government. But then you have agencies like the Universal Basic Education Agency, which is a federal agency and which has some role to play in primary education. And, and part of this confusion um, is why people will say, for example, we need to restructure and move some things from exclusive list, from concurrent list to the residual list. What are your thoughts regarding restructuring, particularly in relation to education? Well, my, my thought is that, um, firstly, there must be a lot of education. And this, I, I recommend, should be led by the press to expose uh, what the relationship, the, how effective the governments are dispensing to local governments monies, you know, from, from the center. Uh, if that is not done, then 
it is it's very difficult for the federal government under this dispensation to enforce uh, education at all levels by respective states, either the state, the local governments, or the, cent the, the center itself. I will give, I think, some, 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 some example of this. In, um, in some of the investigations, it was uncovered that uh, local government chairmen were made to sign for the money that are supposed to be their allocation, but they will only be given about 25% uh, of the money. The rest will be taken by the governor. Mm -hmm. There are investigations in some of the states that are showing that. So I am expecting the press on behalf of the people to make an in-depth investigation and expose corrupt governors you know, and local government chairmen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Well, would, would, you, uh, would, would you be willing to re-examine the UBEC funds? Because those reside with the federal government, and yet they are actually meant for primary education. So they are normally disbursed, I believe, by the federal government. Well, I, I think what has happened so far, anyway, with the UBEC, I, I think there are agencies of government, federal agencies, that in some senses support... Um, uh, the, the support local government and states. But the bulk, I mean, clearly, primary education, as Mr. President has said, lies squarely in the hands of local governments and all of that. But I think with UBEC, what happened with UBEC is that UBEC has an arrangement where they say if, if the state, uh, it, so, so, if, if, so if, they, if there's 20 million for a state, they'll say, well, the state should bring its own counterpart funding of a certain amount of money, it could be 20% or 25%. Now, that percentage is what the states ought to bring to the table before they have access to the UBEC fund. Mm -hmm. Most states never accessed the UBEC funds. They simply said they didn't have the counterpart funding. But, but what has don't, happened? don't you find excuse that me, problematic, excuse me, though? Excuse me. What has happened now, mm -hmm. what has happened now, is that from the Paris Club reforms that was given to the states, the federal government now paid off all of their counterpart funding. So all states can now, can now access UBEC funds without any hindrance whatsoever. Okay. Now, the other questions are to do with disability and with the livestock plan. Mm -hmm. Yes. The livestock plan, I think... The disability? Is, yeah, okay, we'll start with disability. Yes, Mr. President. Okay. Well, I, I honestly cannot remember... Um, this uh, the plan being taken to the National Assembly mm. and how much uh, they have commented yes. on it and send it back to the center. It's the same thing with the disability bill. Um, there are so much with the, uh, with the um, National Assembly. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, I expect honestly, the elite, the press through the elite, to keep an eye on the activities, on the bills between the executive and the National Assembly. Uh, if the executive send a bill, they can hardly uh, put it in the budget unless it is returned from the National Assembly with their comments or with their recommendations. So we, we will find out what's happening with that bill with the National Assembly, and then we'll But a lot of time that. has been wasted. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, Mr. President. Now, um, I, I'd like to do a little follow-up question regarding this livestock, because um, the, we got a question from a, a listener, and I'll try and dig up their name, where they were asking, how do you intend to bring uh, a permanent stop to the difficulties and the conflict going on between farmers and herdsmen? No. Yeah, so, so the conflict. Is your voice? The conflict between farmers oh, and, and herdsmen. Yes, and herders. Well, um, uh, it's, it's what, what happened uh, started from Benway State. Um, 
was unfortunate. And um, we foresaw that. When I say we, I mean the federal government. And we asked the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development to go to the archives and find out the gazettes from the First Republic where those incredible leadership of the First Republic, there was cattle root, there was grazing areas with limited resources. They put windmills, half dumps, uh, and even veterinary clinics. But uh, subsequent very important personalities encroached on the cattle roots, on the grazing areas. And if a herder has 200 cattle, they have just e eaten, they, they, whichever they are way to, to the water pool, they will just uh, go through there. And the, I think the Minister of uh, Agriculture and Water Resources have produced the maps the encroachment. But, but, but these are old maps, and, and this is today's problem. So we might have had a solution to this many years ago in the 60s with the routes and everything, but clearly that solution is no longer tenable now. And so the issue is, this is these are urgent problems that we're facing now. People are dying. People are getting killed. Conflict is breaking out. Um, what are we going to do about it, like now? What we are doing about, we have already started, and uh, we have to ask, uh, especially the governors. The movement is from north to south, and is quite predictable. Um, after the harvest, you know, the they, they cattle have to move south for water and, and faster. And then our borders, for example, between Lake Chad and uh, Benin Republic, about 1,400 kilometers, was Niger alone. And look at the Cameroon's one. A and uh, to effectively serve that uh, border, when structures were tampered with in terms of cattle roots and grazing areas, uh, it it it's very difficult. We have sent this in back through the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development to the governors so that we can create these corridors. But for a government like Benue government, when they said they have banned um, cattle rearing or they have banned grazing, uh, we are in the same country. Um, I expect a government to insist on the roots to be re-established in the grazing areas. But to say that uh, cattle cannot move, it is very difficult. Benue is complaining, but I understand they are already in, in Belsa. From there, are they going into the Atlantic? <laughs> the uh, okay, let Mr. Let me, Mr. Let me President, add, yeah, but can, let, I, can let, I just quickly, let me because, add, because you know, let me, add okay, a, go on. let me add a comment to that. Um, part of what because when the matter was referred to the governors, uh, I chaired the committee, the National Economic Council, and um, part of the plan that the National Economic Council laid out was called the, uh, the Livestock Transformation Plan. All of the governors uh, in the so-called frontline states were also involved in this. And I think that one of the very important points that emerged from the discussions at the National Economic uh, Council was the fact that there was a need to ensure that we were able to create some access to places, to grazing areas. And I think that that's the point also that Mr. President is making, that in order to be, for instance, anywhere where cattle are, you must still have some kind of access so that you then have an area where it could be a ranch, it could just be a place where you have earth dams, it could be a place where you just have water, where, you know, whatever it is. And we then agreed with the governors that because federal government has no land, only state governments, the state governments have land. We then agreed with the, uh, with the state governments that, okay, anyone that is willing, you will put together the resources. If private people want to put together the resources, they can build uh, those areas. They could be called ranches or grazing areas, whatever you call them. 
and people will pay appropriate fees, the cartwheelers will pay appropriate fees, use the facilities, and go back whenever they want to go back. Because clearly, somebody has to bring those cattle to that point. And we try to say that that was an interim phase. Because as time goes on, you, may, you, you will, will eventually be able to stop uh, grazing from one point to the other. Well, but that is, will take time. Yeah, well, so the point is basically uh, Mr. President himself owes you know, cattle. Everybody knows. He's very proud of his cows in Daura and talks about them all the time. But the perception is that he, um, Mr. President is a little bit biased because these are his people that are involved <laughs> and that instead of facing the fact that in the 21st century there's really no room for the cattle rearing in the way we're doing it and coming up with modern ways of cattle rearing, we're trying to hold on to an old-fashioned way of rearing meat. No, but you pointed out already. Let me, let me, uh, let me be Mr. President's counsel. You pointed out already that he has his cattle in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a ranch, in a farm. You know, I don't think that's old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is very... That's, that is current. That you have your, uh, somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I think that the matter, really, is one, as I said, that is within the province of the National Economic Council. And that's why the governors took it up. Because the federal government cannot determine what will happen in any state. Because the states themselves pass laws on their land and the use of their land. We don't have land except federal land. So there's really no way that we can do much with that. And that's why we decided to hold the National Economic Council meetings set up a committee on the Livestock Transformation Plan, and we're working with the state governments. And many of the state governments have given land for purposes of ranching. They've given land for as grazing areas. We are building earth dams in many of the different states. Okay. And I'm the chairman of that particular committee. Now, the thing is this, though. When you think in terms of the problem that mm -hmm. farmers and herders are going through, it's a problem that goes beyond... Um, uh, the right of way, because obviously there's uh, issues around climate change. And I am still a little bit confused about what the government policy is that underpins, you know, our, our, the way we deal with issues around climate, which are sort of the long-term things that you must look at if you have to come up with a solution mm. that is going to last. Mm. I, think, I, I think that that is precisely the point that is being made. That, let, let me explain, perhaps I need to go into a bit more detail about the work of the National Economic Council on this Livestock Transformation Plan. As I said, the reason why we had to constitute the governors into, where we had to constitute ourselves into a committee was precisely because we recognized that the reason why we have all these clashes between herdsmen and farmers is because of desertification. It's because of, the, of all of the conflicts over pasture and water. A lot of that is climate change related. Now, every state controls territory. Every state controls land. And under the Land Use Act, it is the state governor that has absolute control over the land of his state. It is the state governor that gives you permission, even the federal government, whatever you want to do on their land, they must give you development uh, control permit, even if it's on federal land, if you have any land that's federal. Now, that's why we sat with the state governors, and we decided that, look, this is an issue that's almost seasonal, and it's getting worse now because of desertification. Now there's some, especially coming from the Sahel. So I guess the question I was trying to ask was whether there's a policy around desertification and climate oh, change and, and, and what the government is doing to mitigate oh, of course. these things. Of course. That's, of course, clearly there is. And one of the major, one of the major uh, policies is, is, is what is called the Green Wall Project. We have the Green Wall Project basically to control desertification coming from the Sahel. The Minister of Environment has been working on that for years. Now, the other issue, of course, is that we're also cooperating with our neighbors on, on, on desertification issues. Mm -hmm. That's our, our neighbors in the northern part of, 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 of the, 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 in North Africa. We're also cooperating with the north, northern part of West Africa, uh, Niger, Niger, Chad, etc. And then there's also the project to recharge the Lake Chad, because that's one of the very important projects. And, Mr. President is the one who uh, particularly pushed uh, the Lake Chad project, mm -hmm. you know, to recharge it because, as you know, the Lake Chad has almost completely shrunk uh, from about 35,000 square meters mm -hmm. to about 1,300 or so square meters. 
So we need to recharge the late charge from the Congo Basin, and that's mm -hmm. one of the projects. Okay, before we go for a break, I want you to just quickly clarify for me, what is the federal government policy there for when it comes to mitigating this conflict? Is it to have ranches, or is it to continue having these grazing corridors? Is it a mixture of the two? It's a, it, it, for now, what we have is a mixture. What we have is a mixture now, because, but ultimately, what the governors are saying in that in their respective states, they will provide for those who want to do the business of ranching sufficient space to do so. In the interim, they are building earth dams so that cows coming, uh, cattle coming from the north, especially going towards uh, uh, the, 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 the river banks, and you find that a lot of these conflicts are in those areas, are able to, even before they get anywhere near there, are able to access earth dams, water from the earth dams, access uh, veterinary care and all of that. So the long-term plan, of course, is to eventually create ranches, but ranches have to be privately owned. Government cannot create ranches. But at the moment, you can't just suddenly one day say, no more grazing, that's the end of it. Immediate, that doesn't happen anywhere. And in all of the places where the problem has been solved, because the governor's council, that committee, we studied it very carefully, we looked at everywhere where the problem has been solved. And it was a gradual process. It's that same gradual process that we're going through. Okay, we will take a quick break. Don't go away. Welcome back to the candidates. President Muhammadu Buhari and Vice President Yemi Oshibad, your candidates of the ruling APC in the forthcoming presidential elections, are here answering questions on what they have to offer Nigeria and her citizens if they are elected into office again. Um, before the break, uh, I got handed a few questions from people you know, at home. So I'm just going to ask one of those questions and then maybe um, Mr. President can answer that alongside a question that was asked previously on corruption. So, um, Ms. Abisoye Balogu says, um, what does the President want to do with the funds recovered by the EFCC? So, we've had situations where the EFCC has recovered funds which are thought to be um, uh, from corrupt activities. And so, the question from someone at home is that, um, what are you planning to do with those funds? Well, I think um, the government made a statement on that. Firstly, by uh, asking that there should be TSA, Treasury Single Account, so that all monies, you know, either as revenue or from recovered from uh, corrupt people, will go through one single account so that it can be accounted for and how it is taken away. I think I have already made a statement on that issue. And uh, what we are doing is that uh, the extreme deficit in infrastructure, that money will be put you know, for uh, the infrastructure, the roads, the rail, power. But it will go along with budgeting, which means initially the National Assembly, when they approve the budget, whatever deficit is likely to happen, will be funded from that, from that way. Yes, yeah. um, Mr. Vice President, as a lawyer, I'd like to actually ask you, because some people have actually suggested that where a forfeiture has happened without a conviction, it might be problematic spending that money. Um, what is the legal position? Well, the legal position is that once there's a final forfeiture, the asset already belongs to the state. So I, I, frankly, I can't understand what sort of problem would arise so long as there has been a, a, a final forfeiture. Because you know, we, we are having cases where people are not fully charged and no conviction has taken place, but they're being made to return money. Yes. So it's in those cases I'm talking about. Yes. Mm -hmm. when, when, when a person returns, for, for example, we found cases where assets were returned, where houses were returned, mm -hmm. or in some cases where there are, there are houses and all of that, and... What we do is that we advertise, 
We say, if this belongs to you, and you have a legal claim to it, even if it was seized from you, if you have a legal claim, show the legal claim. Show that it was purchased by you know, legal means and all that. If not, it will be forfeited to the state. There's a complete procedure of forfeiture, which is under the existing laws, the ICPC laws, the EFCC laws. There's a complete process. And those processes are what we follow very strictly. And once there's a final forfeiture order by a court, that's the end of it. There are situations where people return assets, whether it's on funds, you know. Those funds that are returned are voluntarily returned. Because if, you're, if, you, if for example, a billion is found in your account and you, and you earn only, you earn only 500,000 Naira a month, then clearly there's some explanation you need to make. Most people would rather voluntarily return the fund rather than go into any arguments with the AFCC. Mm -hmm. And in such cases, we simply forfeit. So, so w w what is the basis for deciding who you're going to prosecute and who you're going to just allow to just return funds? Because we've had a mixed bag. We've had people who've had assets taken away from them and they're walking the streets. Nothing has happened to mm. them. We have people whose assets have been seized and they're being tried. Um, what is the rationale that determines who gets persecuted and well, who works well, away? Well, let, let me say straight away that there is no distinction. The mere fact that someone has returned assets doesn't mean that they are free and can walk away. And there are so many people walking the streets who are on trial, by the way, you know, because you, can be, you are on bail almost within you know, days of your being brought before the court. So that's not the problem. What happens, though, is this. What a prosecutor does is to say, for example, that if you return money, I might decide as a prosecutor to make you a prosecution witness rather than be an accused person. Mm. If, for example, there's a fraud involving five, six people, if you charge all of them, you're not going to find evidence because it, unless you get each of them to make a confessional statement, mm. and the confessional statement only, it only inculpates the person who has made that statement. So you must find one or two of them who will be able to give evidence. So you might say, okay, of these six, I'm going to decide to make two of them who are probably you know, more or less guilty of the same offense or responsible for the same misconduct. But one or two of them will be prosecution witnesses. So that's really the way it goes. Okay. Let me bring uh, Mr. President in because I want to sh switch gear a little bit and start talking about security, right? Mm -hmm. um, Mr. President, we've had people say that Boko Haram has been technically defeated. And yet a technically defeated Boko Haram is killing soldiers in the Northeast. What is going wrong with your fight against Boko Haram? Well, um... I think the best people that really answer that question are people from the Northeast. Uh, that means um, Yobe, Borno, uh, Bochi, Adamawa. Uh, you see, when this administration came in, Boko Haram was holding 17 local governments in the Northeast. They are not holding any local government now. So they have resorted, you know, to indoctrinating young people, especially girls, wrap them up with explosives and dispatch them to soft targets, churches, mosques, marketplaces, motor parks. But the best you can get about the performance of this administration vis-a-vis -vis stopping that... Um, um, Boko Haram occupation of Nigeria is when you visit my degree or beyond. Or, or beyond. Uh, people go back to the land they are farming, they go back to the office, they can drive from my degree to Kano virtually any time of the day, which wasn't happening when we came in. And uh, as I said, I still feel that you, the press, should do more research and not just going and staying in a hotel in Melbourne. Try to go to... Uh, try, try to go to Munguno and talk to, to, to the people. 
But there's no doubt, though, that um, we've seen an increase in attacks against the military in particular by Boko Haram. Uh, in the last uh, six months, we've had two major military installations attacked and soldiers killed. Um, are you at all concerned with this focus or new focus that Boko Haram seems to have, which is basically targeting um, military targets and, and, and the success they've actually had? In, in killing um, hundreds of soldiers in the last few months? Um, you see, thank goodness. Uh, if you have uh, a background of military training, is that uh, when you don't fight any conventional war, now that uh, they are putting tactics of terrorists, they choose their targets, they choose the time, they choose where to attack, at which time. Uh, with that, uh, you have to be highly mobile. You have to have very good communication. And we have resources uh, limitations. Because a lot of Nigerians don't feel that we are in an emergency. That the military needs a lot more money for equipment, a lot more money, uh, you know, for spare parts for communications and so on. But Boko Haram, certainly uh, they are being supported by forces outside Nigeria. Now, you talked about resources. I think uh, since coming into government, my total calculation is that you've spent something like, or you've budgeted, let me not use the word spend, you've budgeted something like 1.8 trillion for defense, and yet, that's the number I have. I might be wrong. That's wrong. That's very wrong. <laughs> okay, we'll cross-check and make sure. But I was told one point. My research showed what over the last three years, I'm talking about three years, 1.8 trillion. Um, so not one budget recycle from 2015 to date. Yeah, 1.8 trillion. Um, and yet we have soldiers complaining about a lack of equipment. We have soldiers, you know, uh, last year we saw Meduguri Airport demonstration by soldiers who felt they were not being looked after. And, and so the question is really, as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, um, how much are you holding the leadership of the Army accountable, given the complaints we're getting from the rank and file about welfare? Um, I received weekly situation report from the military in the front. Um, it's, it's extremely difficult, you know, to, uh, to accuse, uh, you know, the soldiers of going to the extent of demonstrating. But the consequences of that now, well, that uh, the army command has to put investigation, court martial officers and men for demonstrating, because soldiers are not supposed to demonstrate. And then uh, the, the action the military is taking against in the front line, let me call it my uh, degree the front line or the nose, uh, is not uh, normally given to the press because on the trial those who have been tried if they are not found guilty they are supposed to be reabsorbed and posted out but those found guilty are sentenced by the court martial and this is being done okay so the, the concern though for ordinary nigerians is that soldiers appear to be getting punished for being whistleblowers for indicating that all is not well with the military hierarchy and that the military hierarchy is not spending the money that it is allocated um, on soldiers and their welfare. I, are you not concerned at all about that? Certainly I'm concerned um, where we get uh, officers who uh, uh, short-changing troops either misappropriating their Russian accounts or they are not paying them in time. But one of the things I did when I came back clearly and I got the governor of the central bank involved was that uh, 
as far north in the country, there are banks. And soldiers are allowed to open two accounts. One, where their families are, and make a written uh, allocation. And then they take the balance wherever they are. And that was being done. So we foresaw that because of the experience I had in my military service to make sure that uh, there is no longer pay on the table. Mm -hmm. So that pay masters cannot short change them. So you're not convinced that there's anything untoward going on with the, with the military budget? That's what it sounds like, that you're not convinced that there's a case to be answered by the hierarchy of the military? That's what it sounds like. Well, the system, um, I believe the system is still working. Otherwise, there would have been a complete breakdown. The system is working, but it's much more difficult. And don't forget, there are soldiers that think they should only wear a uniform to get the security, mainly the material security, salary, allowances, uh, you know, and accommodation for the family. If you ask them to go to the front, they will put the gun down and disappear. Yeah, but, but, but isn't part of the problem is, is, is that um, not many people feel that Nigeria is a country they can now sacrifice for. People do not feel like no, Nigeria I, is looking after them and therefore they can no, look agree. after Nigeria. No, 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 that's not even fair. <laughs> Frankly, but you say that's not fair? No, no, that's not true. If you look at the sheer number of Nigerians, Nigerian troops that have died, have laid their lives on the line, and we just recently celebrated the Remembrance Day, the commitment of Nigerian troops to this country is unparalleled. There's nowhere else in the world to say any, 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 any suggestion at all that, that they are, that Nigerian troops are not prepared to lay down their lives for the country is certainly not the case at all. And, and I think that's certainly the case for the majority, but we are also saying there are soldiers, if you go on social media, there are videos of soldiers complaining about the fact that they're not being looked after, that they don't have boots. And, um, <laughs> and that uh, the, the demonstration certainly in Meduguri was not something that journalists manufactured. These were soldiers protesting their terms of engagement. And so, so the question is, are there, are there things that are going wrong within the military and which this government, for whatever reason, seems really reluctant to investigate. Because we've not heard of anybody mm -hmm. saying, this is enough concern for us to do something about it. No, no, but frank, frankly, my, my, my take on that is that if, if there are issues, if, for example, they are assuming that there is any uh, misappropriation of government funds, there's a process, you know, there's a clear process for ensuring that that is not the case. And if, if people are found uh, responsible, we, we've had investigations on uh, military spending. Uh, and if people are found to be guilty of those things, they will, they will be prosecuted properly. I think that's it. Okay. Um, there's uh, Amma Mata Suleiman. She had a question to ask Mr. President. Is she in the crowd? No? Okay, we'll take a few more questions on security, please. If you have questions on other things, can you wait until a little bit later? Let's finish with the issue of security now. Questions on security. Yes, sir. The gentleman over there. The gentleman right at the back, and then maybe the one right at the back there in blue. Yes. If you just come and line up, please. Yes. Good evening, Mr. President. It's an honor for me to be here this evening. I think we've done very well. My name is Andrew Ogboro. I think we've done very well in the last four years by the numbers. We are the world poorest. We have 13 million out of school. There is poverty. There is hunger. Our universities are on strike. Now, I am tailoring it along the three items in which the campaigns were held corruption, security, and the economy. We've taken corruption, and I understand how we are fighting that corruption, because we've just been told the former um, Babuchi Lawal has been fired. But still, 
is part of the campaign, so I understand corruption. On security, I have also heard now that until we get more money, we will be where we are. So now I also understand security. So please, I also want to understand the economy so I can go home and tell myself whether to come out and vote or not. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. My name is David Obinna Anyele. I work with Center for Citizens with Disabilities. I'm also the president of Nigerian City Volleyball Federation. Sir, I'm talking about security. Our soldiers went to the war front, in particular in Northeast, and many of them are injured. Specifically, many of them suffered disability. In March 21st, 2015, Mr. President, you promised in Lafia and Nasarawa State that you are going to support and work with the National Assembly to sign the disability bill if they send it to you. On the 18th of December 2018, the National Assembly transmitted the disability bill to your office. Sir, my question, mm -hmm. how do you protect these Nigerian soldiers that have suffered disability by signing a law that will protect them from discrimination and harmful practices? Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, Mr. President and Mr. Vice President. My name is Ayo Oyalo. Firstly, before I ask my question, I need to correct one impression now. The video you're talking about is a fake news that's an, an old video of 2015 that has been, I mean, 2014, that has been disproved. So that needs to be corrected. Now, to talk about security, um, um, first and foremost, the president has said clearly about uh, people spending 16 billion on power, and we, are, we don't have the power yet. So my question is, Mr. President, if you are reelected, do you have any plan to deal with such people? Because the truth is, if people continue to steal and they get away with it and nothing is done, then people will continue to steal. So what is your plan to deal with people who have stolen Nigeria patrimony and are still working free if you come back? Thank you. I'd like to, I'd like to, intervene. Yes. I'd like to intervene on the question that Mr. Oboru asked. Okay. Because it really has to do with the economy, the question of poverty and all of that, and where we are today just so that Mr. Oboru can vote. Mr. Oboru, I, let, 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 let me take the question on Nigeria being the poorest. Now, if you look at the MBS figures, that's the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics figures, as of 2012, Nigeria had 112 million people in extreme poverty, 2012. If you look at the figures today, Going by those same figures, they say about 86 million, but higher than India. Now, let me explain, and let me, let me put this in perspective. From 2010 to 2014, Nigeria earned the highest ever from oil revenues. In four years, Nigeria earned 383 billion. Yet, poverty figures went from about 82 million to 112 million in 2012, and the numbers continued. That's the reason why we had a poverty problem. Unfortunately, with the resources we had, poverty was not addressed. Poverty doesn't disappear overnight. When people are poor, they remain poor unless the government does something about it. Nothing was done despite the highest revenues in our history. In three years, of our own government, three years, 94 billion is what we made from oil revenues. Compare that to 383 billion. Oil at some point was 110 to 114, and we had poverty figures of 112. Now what did we do from the point of view of the economy to alleviate poverty? We started the largest program for social investment in the history of this country. That's why we have the conditional cash transfers. We're giving the poorest people in our country today 5,000 Naira every month. We are only able to give about, we're hoping we'll be able to give about a million to start with. But in order to prevent stark poverty and malnutrition, we're doing our homegrown school feeding. We're feeding 9.2 million children every single day 
in public primary schools. Aside from that, aside from that, the trader money and market money that we're doing, those tra the trader money and market money, these are loans to the poorest. And let me give you an example of the trader money. Could trader money, we're doing. Yes. About the you fact, this? can you hear me now? Yes. yes. You talked about uh, the, the 2012 figures mm -hmm. um, of poverty, how it's 100. So what has happened in the world is that it used to be that extreme poverty was measured at people who live on less than a dollar a day. It's now less than $2 a day. And maybe that might explain the differences in the numbers that you've quoted. No, no, no. I'm not even, I'm not even quoting those numbers to show that there are, I'm, what I'm merely saying is not that poverty has reduced considerably. No. We it are seems merely, to have I'm saying, No, no, no. I'm saying that what has happened now is that we're dealing with the issue of poverty. We're now dealing with it. When, when we earned money, when we earned a lot of money, it, there was no program. The program that was in place, the Shaw P program, who can point to a sensible beneficiary? Who can point to a credible Shaw P program that alleviated poverty? Who can? Let me, let, me, let, 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 let me finish the point that I'm making. Now, with the trader money, for example, I'll give you just one example. We are giving two million uh, market women, we are giving two million of them loans starting with 10,000 10, naira. These are, these are petty traders. Some of them, their inventory is not more than 2,000 naira. We give them 10,000 naira. When they pay back, automatically, electronically, they get 15,000. When they pay back, they get 20,000. And it goes all the way up to 100. And we're, and we're going to give two million people. All of that is 20 billion naira. Just 20 billion now. Now let me tell you what. There was a government in this country where 292 million US dollars was withdrawn weeks to the, to, to the elections. Weeks to the elections. Another 40 billion was withdrawn. Weeks to the election. We have all the evidence. We've shown the evidence. Poverty at that time was still at 112. Today we're spending a, a mere 20 billion for 2 million people. If you calculate just $100 million, that today's money is 36 billion naira. If they had spent that 36 billion naira, more people would have moved out of poverty before we took office in 2015. Okay, let me... So let us not, so, so, so let us not talk... So let us not talk... So when we talk about poverty, so when we talk about poverty today, you can't... India, India had a plan to get its people out of poverty. That's how come India has even overtaken us. The first plan to get people out of poverty, a credible plan, is what we have in place. We're spending 500 billion. We're spending 500 billion in our budget. You, poverty doesn't disappear. You've got to deal with it. And that's exactly what we're doing. We are dealing with it on a daily basis. We have a credible program. We're ensuring that that program works. And that's how it's done. Okay. All of today, it's, isn't it incredible? And, I, and Mr. Oboro, you two should find it completely incredible that people who squandered the kind of money, when, when oil was $100, $100 a barrel, poverty was at 112 million extremely poor. Those same people today come and ask the sorts of questions and say, oh, but we're still poor. Quick, we're poor because we nobody okay. took the trouble to get people out of poverty. Okay. And that's what we're doing today. We have, to, we have to take a quick break, but before we do a quick question, again and again, when we talk to people in government, you keep talking about 16 years of PDP. For many Nigerians, the PDP and APC are two sides of the same coin, simply because you've got so many PDP people in APC, and now some APC people have gone to PDP, and PDP people have come to APC. What is the difference, really, between you and the people you've replaced? I, I think there's a huge difference. I think there's a massive difference. At, at the core of any political party, at the core of the political party, is, is an ideology, is a philosophy. At the core of the APC, whether you have some people coming in from PDP 
or coming in from elsewhere. At the core is what our manifesto speaks about. Our manifesto speaks about the social development of Nigeria, in particular, looking at issues of the ordinary Nigerian. How do we lift the ordinary Nigerian out of poverty? That has been our focus. That guides everything we do. It guides our budgets. It guides the way we develop our budget. It guides the way we think. It guides our economic recovery and growth plan. At the core, there must be a core. The membership, membership of a political party is open to everybody. People are going to come from anywhere. But you must have a core belief. And we have a core belief. That core belief is what has seen us doing our social investment program, is what has seen us investing in infrastructure, despite earning 60% less than previous governments. Okay. We, are in, we are investing the largest amount of money ever in the history of this country in infrastructure. OK. Yes. It's time for another break. We won't be away for too long, so please stay with us. Welcome back. You are watching The Candidates, brought to you by Daria Media and the Nigeria Television Authority with the support of the Mark Arthur Foundation. Um, we've got a number of questions, Mr. President, so I'll read a few and then come back to you. There was a question that we didn't get to addressing, which was on um, whether you have any special plans different to the plans you have now to deal with people who are corrupt and are walking around freely if you are elected into office. There was the issue of the connection between corruption and infrastructure. I don't know if you want to talk to that. And I'm going to ask two more questions, and then we'll take them together. Um, the gentleman or lady who wrote this didn't say their name, but they said that there are some categories of military retirees who fought on the Nigerian side during the Biafran War and are yet to get any form of pension because they didn't complete the number of years to be entitled to pension. Whereas their counterparts who fought on the Biafran side against Nigeria are receiving pensions because they were pardoned. Is there any plan to address this? Um, and then the final question, um, because we're talking about corruption again, um, why has your government remained silent about the corruption allegations against the governor of Kano State, Abdullahi Ganduje? And why have we even seen you standing next to him at a rally? So, three questions. The <laughs> These are all directed at Mr. President. So corruption, yes, let me, let me recap again just to remind you. The first is corruption and infrastructure. Yes, well, um, fighting corruption, uh, I think I have already made a comment on that much earlier on. But the important thing is that um, uh, you cannot catch Nigeria on paper because we have got all the regulations laid down. And the ministries, and the parent status them, themselves, you know, government offices. So it's a question of effective supervision. Effective supervision using the accountant general, the auditor general, to make sure that uh, budgets are studied and then uh, accounts, you know, uh, are checked and making sure that um, uh, those who mismanage public funds are punished. I think this government, uh, as I said about a week ago, I will have to ask EFCC and ICPC to make a comprehensive, you know, submission to the public about what has been recovered and from whom. Um, people are voluntarily bringing money. And we are seeking the cooperation of the United States and Europe to please help us uh, recover uh, assets uh, from those countries. Uh, these are quite detailed and are documented, and I think we have to, it's high time we go to public visit uh, to, to show that how much is recovered uh, and with TSA, that amount of money, nobody can remove them unless we do it through the budget and through the office of the president. 
Um, so in other words, Mr. President, um, the, the questionnaire was trying to find out whether you would do anything new. You're saying you're going to carry on with the same strategy if you are re-elected in terms of the fight against corruption. Because I think the question was, the question I was trying to find out if you had other plans in addition to what you're doing now, if you come back as president. I, I, okay, so, so the question I was trying to find out if in addition to what you are doing today yes. to fight corruption, there are plans to do more if you are elected into office again, or whether it's going to be more of the same strategy. I think that, that is quite obvious. Okay. As I said, we are following a tedious way of doing it. We have to go through the documents. We are lucky the banks are cooperating, uh, and we go and find out uh, people who are living beyond their means, or where contracts were given for projects and they were not executed, or, or are not executed according to signed agreements on specifications and so on. And that takes time, because uh, what we found out is, is a, it's a nasty process. You get a, a determined Nigerian patriotic pass through university, this is NYSE. If he served five years under a crook, he eventually becomes a crook. Yes. And we, we came, we, we, we cut the top, we removed permanent secretary, we removed some directors, but these people that are coming up, some of them were involved in, in mismanagement of resources. Okay. I find um, this problem extremely difficult, and we have got the legal problem. Uh, unless you have got your documents through the banks, through companies, and you take them to the court, you are not going to get any decision. So you're sounding as if you're a little bit frustrated at the slow pace of what you see as your fight against corruption. You said? Are, are you getting a little bit frustrated by the slow pace of the fight? I, can't, I, I can't afford to get frustrated. Um, I, <laughs> I, I keep on telling the law enforcement agencies, you know, and the administrators in the ministries, uh, you know, it's their own responsibility, you know, to, to document mismanagement, you know, and if it has to come to presidency, let him be. I can't ask, you know, to be elected, you know, on um, security, economy, and, and fighting corruption. And then I, I, I get frustrated because uh, uh, some people are not cooperating. I cannot afford. So there was the second question about uh, Governor Abdullahi Ganduje of Kano and why we have not heard you make any comment on this matter. And people are surprised they saw you on a podium with him raising his hand and campaigning with no, him. That's not true. No, um, I, I, will, I will defend myself on that. Um, <laughs> I haven't gone to Kano yet. Right. I have just uh, gone to um, Kogi today in my venue. That clip, somebody brought it me, how the governor of Kano said we're receiving dollars and smiling and putting it in his pocket. I don't know the extent of technology used and I can't understand it. Now, because the state assembly has taken it, they have gone to court, I decided, you know, not to talk about it. And uh, I, uh, the state assembly, constitutionally, they could have dealt with that. Did but then again, the matter was taken to court. <laughs> you know? what? Okay, but what, what, are, what, 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 are, what are your thoughts? about that video? Do you have any personal thoughts? Do you believe that video is fake or do you believe it is legitimate? Ah, you can't say no. As he I can told, talk for himself. He doesn't know. He doesn't As know. I told you, I, I have seen the clip. Um, I, I don't know how much technology was used, but uh, can Genduji fail to trust somebody to get the money to him? He has <laughs> He has to take it directly himself, smiling. I, I honestly am completely overwhelmed. And, and 
the system has given me some relief. It is in the court, it is in the state assembly, so let them as much as possible deal with it. But Kano, this, is, this thing has received a lot of publicity. And I hope uh, by the time I go on my campaign for re-election, there will be some answers from the courts or the state assembly in Kano State about the performance of that. The, the final question, Mr. President, that um, I, I read earlier is to do with the military retirees. Can we please have some silence? Sorry, apologies. Yeah. So the question on um, military retirees who fought on the side of Nigeria but who didn't serve the requisite number of years and so are not receiving pensions, even though their counterparts, the same story, but they served on the side of Biafra, got pardoned and therefore are able to access pension. That, do you have any plans for those Nigerian soldiers and how to help them access their pension? We are extremely concerned about the morale of uh, not only soldiers, but retired people. I think if you are following up about three weeks ago, two to three weeks ago, what we did with the Nigerian Airways workers, uh, we, pay, we paid them. And uh, I know the military, uh, they are conducting um, checks through military hospitals and record offices about people who are, who are retired. Uh, and I think payments are, are, be, are, are being made even to the families of the deceased. Um, there had been so much fraud from records, you know, to physical, even wounded uh, soldiers, uh, those, those who were incapacitated. And this government is, is, uh, is going back to the records, checking with the hospitals, checking with units, and the record offices about, about soldiers. And I believe uh, of, of recent, what we have done with the airways workers and, and so on, we are doing it uh, in the military. It was a continuous exercise. And I believe uh, the military are uh, having confidence that now they are being looked after, especially uh, the ones that uh, were injured and they became dis disabled. We are revisiting all, all, all that. Okay, so since we're talking about disability, there was a question asked about a bill that was transmitted to you, the disability bill, which you have um, not signed. About? The disability bill disability. that was transmitted to you by the National Assembly and which you haven't signed. Do you want to respond to that? It was asked by a gentleman. Mm. Yeah. Injured and rehabilitation. No, no, the disability bill. Disability. The one sent to the National Assembly. Yes. But... Uh, Disability bill. It's been, it's been think, sent to the president. I, th I think we sent to the National Assembly. They returned it to you. I'm not aware of that. I, it's been returned. No. It, it's even as of Wednesday, yeah. even as of Wednesday, there was, a, there was a demonstration in front of the National Assembly mm -hmm. where they were saying that they were giving the National Assembly seven days mm -hmm. to transmit the bill okay. to, the, to, the, uh, to us, to the president's. I'm not aware of that. Okay. Well, let, aware. Yeah, let me quickly um, ask you a few questions on the economy because we are running out of time and we have to round up very, very quickly. You are the chair, of course, of the National Council on the Economy. I can't hear you well. Can you you are the chair of the National Council on the Economy. So yes. I want to direct this particular mm -hmm. question to you and it's been coming in through various means as well. Mm -hmm. When you came into government, in 2015, you essentially came into office and there was an economy that was growing. Not long after that, we went at negative growth and then recession. How do you explain inheriting a robust economy and then going into a recession? Well, well I, th I, think, I think it's a very good question. But let me tell you, first of all, that as of 2013, the Minister of Finance, Ngozi okonjo Uwela, the then Minister of Finance, had already indicated clearly that the country was going into a recession. As of 2014, 
we were already, we were already going into about 3% growth, 4% as of 2014, 2015. As of the time when we took over office, it was very clear the direction that the, that the economy of the country was going. At that time, we had external reserves of 28, uh, about 28 million, uh, billion dollars. When we were at the time earning between 100, 100 and 114 dollars a barrel. If you look at the figures, if you look at the growth figures, the growth figures were actually declining mm. as of 2014, 2015. So there was, it wasn't a question of the growth figures going up as of 2015 when we took over office. As a matter of fact, it was in decline. Now, what worsened the situation? What worsened the situation is that you would have expected that in the periods of, in the periods of prosperity, the four years preceding, when we earned 383 billion US dollars, that there will be some savings. Even uh, the finance minister then, Okonjo Oweala, complained that there were no savings and that there ought to have been savings. And there are several other people who have admitted that they ought to have put some money aside. When we came into office, oil was at $28 a barrel, down from an up of 100 to 114. And then we were losing production in, 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 the, uh, in the Niger Delta. We were losing up to a million barrels a day. So we were in a situation where the economy was already on a downward slide, no savings whatsoever. We were losing on production. So clearly, I mean, for a country that was solely earning money from, uh, from, from oil, mm. and when your oil is down to $28 a barrel, you are not producing up to a million, Clearly, you're going to enter I mean, I mean, those, Okay, so yeah. those are valid yes. points to make. But the argument has been that mm -hmm. we kind of knew it was coming. And our, our, our way of handling it, particularly the confusing policies of the CBN at the time, the eroded public. the CBN, mm -hmm. eroded confidence, and so led to capital flight and a, a whole bunch of other issues, thereby making a bad situation much worse. I, I you take a, no responsibility at all. I don't agree all. with you. I don't agree with you. You see, the point of the matter is that it's easy to advance a point of view and say that that point of view is responsible for what, what we saw. And, and the point I was making to you is that there was a steady decline. Obviously, if the CBN took the view, if the CBN took the view, for example, that at 28 uh, billion dollars in our external reserves. We have to rationalize uh, foreign exchange in order to ensure that only those things that we needed could be imported. That's the point of view that they took. I think that whichever way you chose to slice it, we probably would have ended up in much the same place. Mm -hmm. what, we did, what we did in order to be able to improve our circumstances was first to say, for agriculture, we decided that, look, from importing $5 million of rice every single day, we want to be self-sufficient in rice. So today, we are practically self-sufficient in rice. We are importing only 2% of what we used to import as of 2014. So, and we have saved, and we've saved so far $24 billion. Now, 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 now sorry, just, just, just give me a, a second. Thing, just a give me a thing. second, just give me a second. Okay. Compared to 2014, mm. when we were earning 100 to 114, dollars a barrel on oil, with 28 billion in foreign reserve. We have foreign reserve today in excess of 40 billion, earning 60% less. So I think, so I, so, so I think, I think, I think we deserve, I think to a certain extent, we deserve, you know, some bit of comment, of, of accolades for that. Are you, are you, just two quick questions. Are you, are you at all, concerned that over 20% of our budget, something like, I think, 2 million, is just goes on interest to pay loans. Because that has been um, something that people has looked at as an indicator of the fact that our economy is a little bit less than healthy. That's number one. Then number two, on the yeah. issue of rice. On the issue um, of rice. rice. There is um, some suggestion that there's a lot of uh, uh, smuggling of rice through our porous borders. And that's why the official numbers have actually gone down, but that we're actually still bringing in rice. It's just not coming through official channels. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Let, let me take the first question on debt. Yes. With debt, the, the question that you need to ask is, what are you borrowing for? Every country in the world that wants to make serious development, that wants to undergo some serious development, borrows money. 
We, at the moment, our debt to GDP is one of the lowest in the world. It's about 20%. And if you look at, if you look at comparator countries, if you look at comparator countries, Ethiopia is in excess of 50%. Ghana, that people cite, is in excess of 60%. Uh, several countries of the world, I mean, uh, 70 and above. We are still very low debt to GDP. Now, now the but point but of the, the DMO, yes. for example, yeah. the recommendations that they've made about sort of the percentages that which was we are already way over those recommendations. Is that not a problem? No, 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 no. Let me tell you. Let, let me explain so that you 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 you'll understand this better. Now, what you put aside to service your debt, right? Is, the question you need to ask is what are you spending on? What we are spending on is infrastructure. So that in itself is meant to generate revenue, is meant to do well for the economy. So we're building the Lagos Canal Rail. Our counterpart funding, we put on the table, our whole counterpart funding. We've done Alajawari, we completed Abuja, Kaduna, we completed uh, the light rail within, uh, uh, within Abuja here. Lagos, Ibadan Express, we're doing it. Second Niger Bridge, these are borrowings that we took and we ensured that they were for infrastructure. And for the first time in, 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 in about 10 years, we are spending almost 30% of our revenues on capital, on infrastructure. So, so clearly, so clearly, so clearly, if you talk about borrowing, you know, people talk about borrowing as if, oh, it's an individual that's borrowing. A government, a country, borrows and uses, what a country does is that you need to use your GDP, you need to consider what your G GDP is. The problem that we sometimes have is what, what is called revenue, uh, debt to revenue. In other words, we are not making enough money from revenues. Mm -hmm. In other words, from taxes, we are not getting enough money. It is, it is higher than ever before, as, you, as we've seen from the figures. From oil, we should be earning more. From other sources, we should be earning more. So really what we should be doing, and th this is what the government has been working on consistently, is earning more. So we have a debt to revenue issue. In other words, what we should be earning is much less than what our debt is. Mm. But fortunately for us, most of our debt is local. Most of our debt is Naira mm. because it's in treasury bills and all that. So we, we are not in any kind of danger and we are borrowing right. We are borrowing for the right things. Okay. We are borrowing for infrastructure. Well, we have very little time, so I'm going to ask uh, Mr. President asked... one question and then Sorry. ask the two of you a single question. So, um, Mr. President, there has been a lot of speculation around your health. And the concern is that if you come and win a second term of office, whether you will be healthy enough to run. Um, are you okay? Will you be able <laughs> to contest and run for office? That's number one. And the final question, and it's to the both of you. If you lose elections, will you accept and if, go back if home? What? If, you, if lose. you lose elections, will you accept the results? Well, that sounds like if impossible. I, <laughs> I, I think... Um, we have made our case, and I hope you will have time to watch my visits to Bauchi, to Kogi, and try and watch the other visits uh, to the states, and then see whether I'm fit or not. The way I go around the stadium and respond to the cheers of, of, of voters and explain our position and explain to them where we found the country when we came 2015, where we are now, what we were able to do in between with the resources available to us. And uh, I'm very, very satisfied with the reaction from the real voters. But still, if something happens, and you lose elections, will you accept the results? That wouldn't be the first time I lose the election. Don't forget. <laughs> Don't forget. I, I, tri I tried uh, 2003, and I was in court for 30 months. 2007, I was in court for 18 months. 2011, I was in court for eight months. 
and I went up to Supreme Court. The third time, I said, God day. And the fourth time, <laughs> God and technology came in. The PBC and card readers, you know, the opposition took it for granted. Before what they used to do, sit down, look at constituencies or states, a lot marks or a lot uh, seats in constituencies, and they say anybody who disagrees should go to court. Now, most of my voters are looking for the next meal. Why do they get money to go to court? Mm. So they say, God day. And eventually, God day. <laughs> so, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Sadly, we have run out of time, and we have to leave it here. I'd like to thank Mr. President again and Mr. Vice President for making themselves available for this program. The next edition of the candidates will take place, God willing, in exactly seven days, from 7 to 9 p.m. It will be a live show once more, and we'll be talking to the presidential and vice presidential candidates of the African Action Congress, Mr. Omoyele Showori and Mr. Ahmed Rufai. Mm -hmm. Please join us until then. On behalf of the team at Daria Media, the Niger Television Authority, the MacArthur Foundation, and all of our other partners, we thank you for watching. Have a very good evening. <laughs>